But I think there are lessons to be learned for, for all of us, especially in light of in the discussions of the last few minutes. I love high tech as much as anybody, but I have a gr great fondness for simplicity as well. And that's one of the reasons I'm very fond of semi-closed breathing apparatus. But I'm not the first person who had an interest in uh, rebreathers. <clears throat> I'm going to switch to my biblical, biblical voice for a moment. And God said, let there be a rebreather. And there was. And it was good. And God said, let there be a bountiful supply of oxygen, enough for seven billion people and all the animals of the sea and the land. And there was. And God said, let this rebreather have a breathing bag large enough so that no man or no person's, no animal's breath should be restricted. And there was. And finally, he said, for all these carbon dioxide produced by humankind and, and animals, let me have a way of removing carbon dioxide. And he produced that as well. And finally, he said, let me put a brain in humankind so that they can take care of my rebreather. And that is arguably the only mistake God has ever made. As we have attempted to take part of God's creation, air, the earth, and take it underwater with us, of course, the simplest way to do that is with open circuit. As all of you folks know, and I suspect as all of you folks have originally trained. And this is a photo taken by my friends in Antarctica, which illustrates the wastage of air. What you're looking at is two divers underneath a sheet of Antarctic ice, and what you're seeing here, of course, are pockets of gas or pockets of air, perfectly breathable air if, in fact, you had a little bit of oxygen added to it and CO2 removed from it. Well, we can make things complicated, and this is with a uh, mixed gas electronic rebreather, and you're all very familiar with that. Perhaps you've forgotten how simple things can be in the semi-clothes type of rebreather, where all you have is a constant makeup flow of gas, you have a canister to remove CO2, and you have a breathing bag. And then you also have a constant flow of gas, which allows gas to be removed. Now, in the military, we were used to using semi-closed rebreathers way back. This is Mark VI, which was used in Sea Lab. And I don't recall the name of this seal, but during the Sea Lab days, the uh, seal was very fond of this Mark VI and the divers because they made no bubbles or very few bubbles. It looked archaic by today's standards. But this particular semi-closed UVA was designed to be hookah supplied or umbilical supplied. And it worked. It worked very deep. It worked safely. Uh, Germany was one of the big uh, manufacturers, or Draeger was one of the large manufacturers of semi-closed rebreathers. And they still are. Now, this is the FGT. And it was a 25 kilogram, 55 pound rebreather. The Mark VI was not much smaller or lighter. This is another view of the Draeger FGT. And all of these early series of semi-closed rebreathers had a feature that they tended to use a large flow of gas, say 13 liters. So if you had a NATO mix, 32.5% oxygen, uh, if you had that gas flowing at 13 liters per minute, you could dive safely to 42, 54 meters. But there were, soon became a trend, and most of you are the recipients of that trend, of making semi-closed rebreathers smaller. Not everybody is a large EOD military diver. Not every, everybody wants to have two large cylinders on their back. You don't want to demonstrate your manhood, especially if you're a woman, female. You don't want to be burdened down with half your weight in semi-clothes gear. 
So manufacturers started making smaller and smaller rebreathers, as you see here, from the Mark VI. You look at the weight in itself, all the way down to the the other end of the scale, the Fiano Grand Bleu, Japanese. I don't know why they have a French name with a Japanese rig, but they did. But it's a minuscule rig, 12 pounds, had a, an approximately 40-minute duration, and used a 40% O2 mix, only safe for use down to 30 meters in seawater. Well, there are a variety of types of SCRs. I'm not going to go through all of those now. Fortunately, there are excellent reference books you can find. Kevin Gurr has written one. Jeff Bozanik has written one. There are others. Uh, but one of the products of this diminution of the size of the rebreather is the unavoidable fact if you have a smaller rebreather, you have a smaller tank. If you want somebody to make a dive on that smaller tank, then you have to reduce the steady flow gas rate that's being supplied to the, to the diver. And therein lay some problems that we, the U.S. Navy, did not fully appreciate until we almost had some accidents. And in just a moment, I'll describe those near accidents to you. Those from Draeger, the Lar 7 we have looked at, but probably the best well known to the People here is currently the Dolphin or its predecessor, the Atlantis. These are relatively simple from a mechanical standpoint, where you have a constant flow of gas being delivered to the diver. However, I like to say that in spite of their mechanical simplicity, physiologically, they're very complicated because what happens to the diver is entirely dependent upon what he's doing, he or she, how deep he or she is, how hard they're working, what the gas mix is. So you get yourself thrown into a conundrum with a very simple, small rig, and you may find yourself in problems, having problems. And I think that's one of the reasons why semi-closed UVA, semi-closed rebreathers, have an accident record which is really no better than the more complex electronic rigs. Navy looked at uh, some Canadian rigs, military use only, but they are typical of constant mass flow rebreathers. Viper SC started off as a Canadian rig. Carlton, which is a British company, bought it. Uh, it is used by an elite group of individuals in the military. And it's when we started looking at the Viper or the SIVA 55, as it was called, that was when we noticed that there had been a generational change from the old, large, semi-closed devices to the smaller, more compact semi-closed devices. We knew the history of these large rigs, like the Mark VI, and we knew basically there were, were no troubles. They were a fine rig. You can take a big strapping guy and go do a big strapping mission with no real medical or physiological concerns. We assume that was the case with these rigs. Uh, before, again, before I get to our learning experience, I'll mention the uh, Divex Shadow Excursion, another constant mass injection rig, wonderful rig. We almost got it implemented into the military, but other things interfered at the last minute. But another example of an excellent rebreather, semi-closed rebreather. One of the things that I demanded, first of all, with this rig, the Viper SC, and this rig as well, was that there be an oxygen monitor on it. Does it defeat the point of having a non-electronic rig if you have an oxygen monitor? Heck no. That monitor can save your life. And as we discovered, once we almost lost a diver or two ourselves, my feeling is, if I owned Draeger Dolphin, for instance, I would absolutely put an oxygen monitor on there. I don't like playing this guessing game of am I working in just the right regime to keep myself healthy and safe in terms of oxygen concentration. I want to know what that oxygen partial pressure is. So when the Navy is testing and diving with semi-closed rebreathers, um, we certainly t use oxygen monitors to the what, to whatever extent we can, we built a block right up here for this test diver and included an oxygen monitor, and we plumbed up a 
Drager monitor with the connection to a VR3 dive computer here. We did this to record the data and also so the diver himself could see what his oxygen concentration, oxygen partial pressure was at all time. Now, for the simplest semi-close, this is not for all of them, but for the constant mass injection, mathematically, it, it really is simple. The fraction of inspired oxygen is simply a product of the fraction of O2 in your gas mix. The injection rate, anywhere from four to, as we saw earlier, 13 liters per minute, typically four to six liters per minute, and this is where the diver comes in. Oxygen consumption, mathematical symbol for that. Consumption of oxygen. How hard is the diver working? But as we discovered, we did not have a good mathematical description for the time course. So if you have a diver who is working mildly, moderate, doing moderate work, and all of a sudden starts working very hard, the question that we have to have is, how quickly is this diver going to run into trouble? Well, you can see so-called steady state values on the right. I can find my cursor. This is frustrating. If you have, for this particular starting point of 0.7 fraction of oxygen at the beginning of the dive, and you're working at one and a half liters per minute, then the simple math for these simple rigs says your steady state value of fraction of O2 is going to be 0.5. If you're working harder, 0.4. 2.5 liters per minute oxygen consumption, then 0.2. And God forbid if you're working at 2.8, within a few minutes, you're going, going to have no oxygen in your bloodstream at all. That's not a good thing. A friend of ours, Lou Knuckles, did some tests and computer monitoring in, um, at NEDU, and he converted the fraction of oxygen into partial pressure. It's a simple mathematical exercise, but these are computer simulations, and again, it showed that anything above about 1.5 liters per minute would lead you to a hypoxic event within a very few minutes. Again, for particular starting conditions, in this case, this was a four and a half liter per minute constant flow injection rate of 50-50 nitrox. Now, where the size came back into it is when I started looking into why are the new rigs really so much different from the old rigs, and this again is using the simple math that we just had shown you. I said here if we have a plot of inspired oxygen along the vertical axis and oxygen consumption here, this line is for air at one atmosphere, so it's 0.21 atmospheres partial pressure. With the old style, large rigs had plenty of gas. You could flow 18 and a half liters per minute of 32% O2. And it really didn't matter much what your oxygen consumption was. Your fraction or partial pressure of O2 would remain high. You were perfectly safe. Now as we get to smaller and smaller rebreathers and consequently have to use smaller and smaller injection rates, that is no longer the case. This is at 10 feet of seawater for the, these particular solutions. And typically in a semi-closed rebreather, the worst case is shallow. That's when you're most likely to go hypoxic. But as you see now, as you reduce the fresh, fresh gas injection rate, I cannot see this bloody thing. At any rate, I'll just describe it. In the top line, you see your partial pressure of oxygen decreases non-linearly. Now, we threw some divers in the water in a test pool, and this happened to be at the Drager Nitrox, LAR-7. We were using comparative testing of a number of rigs. Eventually, we selected the uh, SEBA rig, but early on, we were looking at the Drager Nitrox, LAR-7 as I said, and we were monitoring oxygen and found out that, holy moly, some guys were getting to pretty dadgum low levels of uh, oxygen after 20 minutes or so, especially when they increased their work, work rate from 50 watts to 75 watts. Well, that concerned us, and what concerned us most is that early on we did not have monitoring uh, 
and these divers could have lost consciousness on us. We quickly started paying closer to attention and started running some tests and found out that, again, with more tests, that the simple fact of closing down or opening the exhaust valve setting on the semi-closed rebreather can make a dramatic effect on whether the diver lost consciousness or not. Notice this event right here. Here the diver closed his exhaust valve. Well, it had it five clicks from closed, pre-daggum closed, and this guy went hypoxic. Well, I wouldn't say that I panicked, but I did become very, very concerned because something was going on that we did not understand. We did not understand and appreciate the interaction between very fit athletic divers and exhaust valve settings on these semi-closed rebreathers. We instrumented some other divers, and this time we were not in a controlled environment of a test pool. We went out to the open ocean, St. Andrews Bay, and at this point I had insisted we have oxygen monitors installed in the systems, and we had a way of recording it and monitoring it. Unfortunately, we couldn't see the recording until the dive was completed. We had two very fit uh, EOD combination SEAL, combination marine divers heading off down a beach profile on a dive. So you see depth increasing here, and PO2 was starting off at about 0.65, and it's pretty steady until the diver stopped. So his workload was reduced considerably. He sat there for a minute while the EDU divers, a little bit more senior, were trying to catch up with him. Finally, they caught up, and new guys said, okay, we're going to head back. You guys try to catch up if you can. And they were kicking to show how, exactly how much testosterone they had, how much muscle mass they had. And everybody was happy. They brought the records back to me, and I downloaded it. I looked at it and said, oh, my God, we almost lost this diver. He at least almost became unconscious at the surface or near the surface. So, this slide wants to advance itself anyway. I might as well make it happy. What I did at that point was start thinking about the math and did a computer simulation. And it took quite a while to develop. And in fact, I showed an early version of it at Rebreather Forum 2. And I now have a, a newer version of it, which I'm not ready to release just yet because I wanted to get every type of semi closed UVA in the simulation, I think I could probably can't do that, not in the time I have left for this lifetime because it's, it's a big ordeal. But as an example, uh, when the simulation starts, it's called UVA sim, when the simulation starts, you're allowed for a semi-closed rebreather to select gas injection rate, six all the way down to three and a half, whatever gas injection rate you want. And you select the O2 fraction and select how much gas you have on board, put in some information about the volumes in the system, how much canister storage you have, how much carbon dioxide storage you have in the canister, and what the bottle pressure is and bar or what have you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to show you one example of a simulated result which is actually de demanded by the mathematics. And this is, by the way, it's not a mathematical model, it's a so-called stochastic model. Those of you who are in simulation would understand the, the difference. It is solving point by point, second by second, the state of all the gas masses and partial pressures in the entire system. And here we have a dive to, I think, 30 feet, 20 feet. And on the top, you see mouth pressure for a diver who is, who is breathing. And over on the left-hand side, you see mouth pressure axis. So mouth pressure, this is taking into account resistances in the UBA, the elasticities, compliances in the breathing bag. It takes all that into account and is showing what the mouth pressure excursion would be. Also, on the bottom, you see the partial pressure of oxygen, which is shown on the right side of the axis, 
and something bad happened. The oxygen dropped down to zero, and the diver lost consciousness 4.1 minutes into the dive at a depth of 20 feet seawater. But no worries. He stopped working so hard because he had a full face mask. He wasn't dead. And as he began to recover from this period of loss of consciousness, he was breathing more slowly. And as he finally became aware of what had just happened, he said to himself, I'm not going to do that again. So he finished up the dive, again, because of the full face mask, and surfaced. Now, here's the case where we have a diver who dove too deep. PO2 was in this simulated case well above three liters, which you can pr probably predict would lead to a seizure at some point. In this simulation, you don't never know exactly when it's going to seize on you. It's uh, somewhat probabilistic. So the diver was surprised by going unconscious at 31.5 feet in seawater, 39 minutes into the dive. Uh, again, because he had a full face mask, once he shook off the results, he went about his business and said, I have to change my gas concentrations, and he survived. So that is my pitch for a full face mask. And I understand and hear some people who have tried it say it's difficult. It's been a long history since we breathed the Forum II. Long history of people saying we can't use a full face mask. Well, I have a number of customers from various places, not just in diving, where they tell me something similar. We can't do that. My answer is always, why not? And In this simulation, we lost two divers. If they had not had a face mask, they would have died. So from my vantage point, and I don't dive a rebreather very often, from my vantage point, I can put up with inconvenience on occasion if it keeps me alive. Now, one of the things I would like to project out to this group, if there are lethal events associated with wearing a full face mask, you need to let us know what that is. As a body, we all need to know why is wearing a full face mask, something which can keep you alive underwater, why is that bad? I think a good, strong argument needs to be made before we accept one way or the other. Sure, it's your prerogative, but we do accident investigations we don't like doing accident investigations, not, especially not on fatality cases. Okay, just to be complete, here's a Swedish rig. I know one of the original designers, Floss Lundgren, of this uh, type of ventilation, and it's very nice. Uh, you may know it better as the ACSC, which is also called, I think, originally, and I'm always mixing this up, Swedish delegates. It's a DCSC first. At any rate, it's now called the IS mix. And the idea behind it is that it's, it's dependent on ventilation. You have a large uh, bellows. In fact, it's weighted. And as the diver breathes, this bellow moves in and out. And so you're getting somewhat control on, on oxygen. And Lee Knuckles went back through and did a computer simulation of how well this type of rig, it's called a constant volume injection rig, how well it controls oxygen in the face of changing metabolic demand. And it does a much better job than the constant mass injection rig. But it is big, it is bulky. Um, that's all I can say. Then you have the ever popular VVE variable volume exhaust rig. On your left is the early Halcyon rig. It's now called an RB80. It's been redesigned. It's somewhat smaller and more compact. Uh, Jack Kellen came by EDU at one point and was showing us how the, his Halcyon was being dived in a cave. And keep in mind, Navy likes to be small, stealthy, sneak in, do bad things without anybody knowing we're there. And he showed typical by modern standards, cave divers surrounded by models. And in the middle somewhere was this Halcyon. We had no idea why he came to see the Navy and show us that. But I did learn about the principle, and the principle is um, exciting, very interested in it. U.S. Divers DC-55, again, a military rig, or the U.S. Oxymix. We looked at that when we were looking at various types of rebreathers to be used by the Navy. We ended up not accepting it for various reasons. But one of the nice things about this type of 
variable volume exhaust semi-flows rebreather, you get beautiful control of oxygen across varying rates of oxygen consumption. It's almost as if this were electronically controlled. So if I had my choice, I would probably look very, very closely at either the Draeger Dolphin, which is uber simple, or something like the RB80, which has a little bit better, more dependable control over oxygen as I vary my work rate from resting to, to hard work. Here are some of the innards. This is a photo I happen to have for the diver's oxymix. It has bellows inside of the bellows. So as you are breathing, part of the gas that you're exhaling is being dumped overboard, and at the same time, new gas is being poured in to replace the gas which is dumped overboard. So again, when you're sitting, not much gas is being exchanged. You're not losing much. When you're working hard, a lot of gas is being exchanged, and that's a good safe thing for oxygen control. Here's a photo of my good friend, uh, David Dulat. I can't tell it's him, but he tells me it's him. Uh, and then lately I've become interested in the KISS gym, which has got to be one of the simplest semi-closed rebreathers ever created. Uh, I'm anxious to get in a, in a laboratory and test it. It's basically a scuba tank. They, it, they don't even call it a rebreather. They say it's a gas extender. But from best I can tell, it really is a semi-closed device. It has a canister, it has a loop, breathing bag, and the genius of it is a valve, which as you inhale, it squirts some of the gas out. As you inhale, it pulls gas in from your, from your gas supply. And the amount of gas that's being exchanged is based entirely on how hard you're working. The harder you work, more gas you get. Very nice system. The Navy has been using semi-closed rebreathers in places you might not expect. This is a typical Navy diver working on building a platform to recover the engine from the monitor. And they're using a hard hat. This is umbilical supplied, but in case of a loss of gas, the diver has a gas supply sitting on his back. That gas supply right there does not last very long at all, especially when you're deep. So we have other saturation divers who have figured out that instead of just putting a scuba bottle on my back, they can put a semi-closed device. This is Divex's SOS backpack system. And because it's semi-closed, now the diver has more time to get back to safety rather than having two or three or four minutes. He has about twice as long to get back to safety, which is usually a diving bell or something like that. This is designed for saturation systems, and doubt you're going to be needing something like that. But it's, it's interesting to see that militaries have a, an interest in a wide variety of semi-closed devices. Well, what's the take-home message? First of all, if you're using the simplest device, keep in mind the use of it is not simple. The only answer to you is to learn as much as you can about not only how the system works, but how you work, the physiology, the interaction between the man and, and the machine, which you've heard a lot about. That man-machine interaction can be very complicated, even in a simple device. Great advocate of full face masks. I would like, as sort of an action item, to have people sit down and explain pros and cons of use of full face masks in a device which can kill you. Big fan of oxygen monitors. I've required it, at least in testing, of all of our semi-closed devices. The only problem we had when we were using our first semi-closed device is that the oxygen monitoring technology was not good enough. Well, now it is. We had no problems when we used the Draeger oxygen monitor combined with the uh, VR3. We had lots of problems when we used an earlier device. Fortunately, that technology has matured. The uh, cabling, which was causing problems earlier, has matured. It's improved. And then lastly, I don't think this is going to be a major killer with semi-closed UBA because they don't have extremely long durations. But again, CO2 monitors would be nice, and that's the direction I think we're ultimately heading. Any questions?